name is Alex von Tunzelman. I'm a British historian and screenwriter. I'm very interested in how fact and fiction speak to each other, and I think we'll be speaking a lot about that today. But let me begin by introducing my unbelievably talented panel of authors. Um, if we begin at the end with Adania Shibley, uh, was born in Palestine. She writes novels, plays, short stories, and non-fiction, a real polymath. Her novel, Minor Detail, was long listed for the International Booker Prize in 2021. Next to her is Louise Kennedy, who grew up near Belfast and worked as a chef for 30 years before becoming a writer, but don't ask her to cook for you, she's here to write today. <laughs> her debut novel, Trespasses, was named as a book of the year by the Washington Post in 2022. Damon Galgut in the middle was born in Pretoria, South Africa. He's a playwright and he's the author of nine novels. The most recent, The Promise, won the Booker Prize in 2021. And next to me here is Kavita Puri, a British journalist and broadcaster, whose oral history, Partition Voices, collects the experiences of survivors of partition living in the UK. It has recently been adapted for the theatre in London. So all of these wonderful writers who I have with us, whether they write fiction, non-fiction, drama, short stories, and many of them write more than one of these genres, engage in very meaningful ways with history. All of the histories they write about um, in Palestine, Ireland, South Africa, India, Pakistan, were touched to some extent by the British Empire, although, of course, that wasn't the only factor shaping them, and particularly in Palestine and South Africa, of course, there were other imperial factors as well. And today I really want us to talk about the interaction of literature and history, facts and fiction, memory and meaning. So let me start by talking to all of the panel about a kind of broad question of why do we keep returning to history? Why are we drawn to history to try and understand something in the present? Damon, can I start with you? Um, hello. I, um, it's, South Africa is a country where history is absolutely inescapable, and there's this kind of expectation from outside, but also oddly from within, um, on all writers to kind of account for history. Um, it's hard to know why that's so, because the, the, that burden of expectation seems bigger or heavier with South Africans than it is on, on other nations where history is just as, as meaningful. Um, but it's true that even on the most simple level, if you're creating a character in a story in South Africa, you have to take into account their race, their class, and what their immediate ancestors might or might not have done. Um, so the minute you start thinking in those terms, you're in history already. I mean, all of us are, but I guess there are, you know, um, maybe national literatures where that weight is not so demanding. I, I'm sorry it's not a fuller answer, but uh, for many uh, years of my writing life, I've been wondering why every time I sit down to write, I feel I need to speak about South Africa and its issues, and every other South African writer that I know has the same um, self-imposed expectation. Um, if I knew the answer, I might be able to free myself of it, but I don't. Louise, you are also based in a kind of you know country with an extraordinarily troubled, we might use the phrase, recent history. Do you also feel like that about why you keep returning to history to speak about the present? Um, I think that maybe it's because um, the, the thing, my book is set in 1975, um, and that's, I, I, that's the part of my life that I spent in the north of Ireland. Um, and I think because most of these things aren't really resolved, you know, the Good Friday, Friday Agreement did deliver peace, and um, um, much fewer lives ha have been lost um, than, you know, would have been the case otherwise if that agreement hadn't uh, been delivered. Um, but yet there's still a political vacuum in the way that there was at the, at the time, you know, that I described in the book. So, um, yeah, I think also there are issues around language um, that still haven't quite been resolved as well, um, you know, the Irish language and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think that's maybe why um, it, it seems to be present in a way, even though it's very much in the past too. And Kavita, you are, you know, sitting in Britain, but a place where perhaps partition is thought about less than it's thought about here, but the people you're speaking to, of course, are very much still living those events. Is that how you feel as well, that the history is not separable from the present? I think, I think that history is the present. Um, but I think that 
what I'm really interested in are the gaps in history, the silences and the absence. Because in Britain, we don't really talk about the empire very much. And it's quite hard to, to believe it, but even the word partition is not a word that is very well known in Britain and what its association is. And so I was trying to excavate the past by collecting memories. I think I'm the only non-fiction writer on the panel. Um, but their, their lives today of the survivors, but also their children and their grandchildren, is completely informed by the past. But what I think is really interesting is it's even informed by the past if they don't know about the past, because somehow, subliminally, that history is passed down for generations, both the trauma of it, but also this feeling of what was lost. Um, and so, yes, history is, is everywhere in our present, but I also think that in Britain right now, um, history and the discussion of empire is a, is a hugely controversial thing. And we are only now really coming to terms with our past and how that controversial past has shaped who we are as a country. That is very much, and you know, you write about this a lot, that is hugely a work in progress. Adonir, I wonder if you relate to this idea about the silences as well in history that uh, Kavita mentioned. Um, why, for you as a Palestinian writer, are you returning to history? How does that inform the present? Well, I, I didn't know that I'm, I'm returning to history. Actually, I, I think uh, literature is, is where maybe history stops where it's the um, almost what history cannot welcome or allow a place for. And, and this is not in terms of only the story, but also the, the way and the, the, the care and maybe the, the, uh, the margins. You know, history is focusing on the central. And, and what about if you are on the margins, what kind of almost uh, sensibility you would have when you are left out of history. I mean, there is history, but there's also past. And, and I'm like following what Kavita says, it's like how this almost present is haunted by a past that history sort of doesn't give a place. And I think this is where fiction comes really um, almost agreeing to leave this category of facts and say, I'm, I'm going with, with my lack of presence in the fact and I accept that and acknowledge that, and I will go to the fiction. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, I want to watch, ask each of these authors a little about uh, their own particular books and how those engage with history. Um, I know some of you will have seen other sessions with them, but they're all so interesting that I want to dig into them. So Damon, to come back to you again, um, The Promise is set over four decades of incredibly turbulent history in South Africa. Your focus is on a white family and the affairs kind of concerning them. But in the background, the world around them is changing dramatically during the progress of this novel. You said in your talk, uh, beginning the festival a couple of days ago, that people's personalities, I thought this was such an interesting comment, that people's personalities are to some extent shaped. What do you think happens to these people when their world is transformed? What happens to those personalities? Um, well, you struggle to change your personality after a certain point. Um, you know, my memory of growing up in Pretoria is of these quite distorted personalities who didn't think of themselves as distorted, but they were very clearly shaped by the beliefs and values of apartheid. Apartheid is gone, and yet these people are still there. I guess this, the sense with a lot of them is um, that they were at the center, or if you like, at the top of the pyramid, and suddenly the carpet's pulled out from under them, their power is gone, and uh, there's a sense of being lost or adrift. Um, some people are able to rethink themselves, I guess, to keep pace with history. It's easier for my generation, really, to think themselves into the new South Africa, to begin to behave differently. But after a certain point, um, I, I sort of feel like human personality is set. You've taken in the values of your society, and you, know, you, you believe those things. 
which is, I guess, why there's always generational clash. Um, you see it, I mean, not only in South Africa, many countries, one generation being angry or baffled by the preceding generation's beliefs and trying very angrily or uh, idealistically to forge a whole new set of values and beliefs. Um, I mean, you, you would see it in Germany, for example, in the generation after the Holocaust, you've got uh, an incredibly angry generation that was the bader meinhof uh, lot who, um, who very clearly had passed a kind of historical judgment on their parents. The sins of the fathers were judged by the children. Very strongly. Louise, you're writing about a very different situation, Trespasses, your novel is set, as you just said, in 1975. So, you know, that's in the early years of the Troubles in Northern Ireland, as they're called. Um, and it's not, it's quite a big, you know, the, the trauma has sort of begun quite recently. I mean, of course there is a generational effect, but the kind of really dramatic conflict is quite recent, so it's quite different from Damon's setup. Um, it's a love story, the book. Uh, a young Catholic school teacher falls for a Protestant man. I won't spoil too much, but that's perhaps the setup. But this is in an atmosphere of intense violence and conflict in the background at all time. How do you think this kind of constant background conflict and violence affects human lives and love? Um, yeah, I, I didn't set out to write a, a troubled uh, novel. Um, you'd have to be out of your mind, I think, um, to, to take something like that on. Um, so, um, I, I mean, I guess I conceived of it as, as a love story. But once I, I, I set it in that place and time, um, uh, I started, because I had left the north of Ireland when I was 12, um, I had to kind of rely on my memory. And I just hoped that if I took the reader along with Kush, who's the main character, it's all very much from her point of view, um, through every part of her day that um, that maybe, I don't know, I could just, you know, recreate what I recall it felt like to, to live in that place. And I found really quickly that what I remembered was the radio being on, on all the time to hear for the news, uh, news flashes when we were watching um, t television, children's television programmes, you know, reporting maybe an explosion or something, um, scuffles over the newspaper when it came into the, the house in the evening. And, um, and, and then also because, maybe because of the demographic of the, the town that I lived in, um, we were part of a very pretty small Catholic community, um, around 10% um, where the rest of the population were 90%, um, you know, sort of Protestant unionist uh, loyalist and, and I suppose what that meant uh, for us, um, you know, the extent to which we had to watch what we said and really make ourselves pretty, I suppose, small and inoffensive and invisible. So that was really what I was uh, what I was trying to, to convey and hoped that, I mean, I just hoped, I mean, maybe I wasn't trying to convey that, but when, when, I, when I recalled what it was like, those are the things that I, I remembered. Adania, um, in minor detail, you begin with a very traumatic event, a horrific rape and murder of a Palestinian woman in the Negev Desert in 1949, a year after the Nakba. Um, Fifty years later, your unnamed narrator, who's also a Palestinian woman, learns about this event, and she's very struck by the fact that this happened 25 years to the day before she was born. So in this book, we have the idea of time and chronology connecting us very strongly to history. Um, in a very personal way. Why is your narrator so driven to reconstruct the history of this event she finds? I mean, she doesn't want to. <laughs> she really doesn't want to. But it's, it's basically the... Uh, uh, when we think about her, she's, she even doesn't trust herself as a person who can carry the story. But probably going back to what also Kavita was saying about the silence, it's almost you being moved by the force of silence, not to, to speak on behalf or for, but almost like to, to excavate the, the silence. And, and uh, you know, uh, it's um, actually uh, a friend of mine was uh, telling me how the criminal, it's only the criminal can solve the crime. And this is what we have in crime scenes. You have the criminal, in any police investigation, you have the criminal trying to retrace the steps of uh, how they committed the crime. And this is very interesting because it's never from the perspective of the victim. Almost we don't have this access. And, uh, but what if you don't want to take the position of the criminal? 
What if you say, I don't want to follow the steps of the criminal. So what options do you have? Is there like a possibility to, to almost find the language uh, of, of that that you refuse to follow the steps of those committed? Oh, what will you be faced with at the end of silence? I mean, we were speaking about silence before, and I, I wonder what can silence bring beyond the concept of being silenced as a possibility. And in fact, you know, I, I remembered something going back to your question about history. When we were kids, um, we used to go to picnics, but it's not like the middle class bourgeois picnics. They were tough picnics. We were forced to go on these picnics because they had a, a, almost like a, a responsibility. We were picking up plants uh, and taking care of the uh, of trees. These trees, they were in villages that were um, uh, people were expelled from. There are about 485 of these villages, and the area where I grew up, uh, we had at least like six or seven of these villages. So we were going back to these villages. You don't have the people. But as if we needed to take care of the plants, they left. Normally, it's fig trees, olive trees, and, and grapes. But also, at that moment, you know, you don't think about like you would like to uh, uh, bring their story as much as to almost live their life, you know? You are not speaking on their behalf, but you're carrying their life within you. And, and I remember as kids, when we finished this boring task of taking care of the, of the trees, you know, we were children, we wanted to play, we didn't want any responsibility like this. And we used to play uh, the lives of these people. So I remember like with my sisters, we were four girls, and we were like, okay, this is the living room, this is this, uh, the bedroom, this is the garden. And, and I think it was also the first exercise of, of um, almost writing, you know, writing, but you're acting it. It's almost like the, the theater that is you discover as a kid as the first form of, of, uh, of art. And um, yeah, so I don't think it's, it's so much going back to tell a story of somebody, but it's almost to carry the, the, their life with your body, maybe. Experiencing it, fascinating. Kavita, you are coming from a different angle. The other panelists here, their most recent books at least, are fiction, although some write non-fiction as well. Your work in Partition Voices approaches history through this quite complicated question that I'm sure we're going to talk about more of memory. You've spoken to survivors of Partition talking 70 years after the fact, and I remember a very interesting introduction I had to oral history of learning that often if you get lots of people speaking about the same event, especially if it's a traumatic event, their accounts will contradict each other, and that's not because they're trying to lie to you, but it's because actually memory is quite complicated. Often your mind forms a record of events that's not necessarily matching everyone else's, but is a version that you can continue to live with. Is this truth? Is that truth? Um, it, is, it is their truth. Um, and... It's, it's interesting because people always ask the question of how can you trust oral history? I would ask the question, how can you trust other forms of more, say, formal evidence? Um, and I think that you... I mean, what is the alternative? That you don't record the oral history of partition um, where so much of it was also the lived experience. You know, you're talking about millions and millions of people crossing a border, millions who died... Um, you know, would we, would we not, it, it, why would we not collect the oral history of the Holocaust? I mean, to me, that makes no sense. I think what you have to do is be very upfront and say, I am recording these testimonies 70 years after the event. And after 70 years, my goodness, memories change. Um, but there is also a clarity to it what you choose to remember and what you choose to tell. And sometimes, when I was interviewing my, my interviewees, um, I, they would give you such tiny details that you know that couldn't be made up. Um, it just couldn't be. And sometimes, when they're telling you, and often remember they were speaking for the first time out loud about these stories, even their family members hadn't heard it, you could see 
from the way that they were speaking, they were remembering, they were pausing. Sometimes it was almost like they were seeing it before themselves. That felt very real. Now, sometimes they would say things like, such and such happened, and I'd say, did you see that? No, 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 my aunt told me. So there are ways to ask questions, to verify. There are facts that you can verify. But I think you just have to, to record and probe and respect. What I think is interesting is that when I interviewed children and grandchildren, that was second and third hand memory. And so how does that original memory from the survivors, how is that passed on? And again, that changes and morphs just like memory does. Um, and so it is fact, perhaps a little bit of fiction, but it is their truth and it is worthy, I think, of being recorded. You remind me of um, the well, not personally, but of a quote from the Welsh socialist politician and Iron Bevan, who always used to end his stories with, this is my truth, tell me yours, that a reflection that there can perhaps be multiple truths yeah. and multiple realities. Yeah. <clears throat> I would like everyone on the panel to reflect possibly on the idea that comes up quite a lot about whether perhaps, with that in mind, fiction can tell us a sort of truth that non-fiction cannot. I will come to Cavita last on this because I think you should hear about some actual fiction writers. But I think there's an interesting way to apply it to your work. Could I start with Louise? Louise, do you think fiction can perhaps get closer to some sort of truth sometimes than history? Um, I, I think that, um, yeah, I couldn't. I, I, I drew quite a lot on, uh, on my family's experience of the troubles in the, in the novel, um, but I couldn't possibly have written that as, a, as memoir or presented it as non-fiction in any way. Partly because um, some of the stories within, you know, my kind of broader family lore, they're not really mine to tell. But I did feel that I was able to, to maybe work with um, with um, elements of them. And, and since the book was published, you know, at, at readings and stuff, I've met people afterwards who've said, you know, that my family was like that. We had a bar. It was bombed. We left. We did this. And you know, so you know, maybe some of those kind of um, uh, things that you think are, are sort of very personal and unique um, really. Um, are part of the broader experience or something. Um, so I don't know. I mean, sometimes I think that maybe um, I lack courage or something, you know, by, by sort of sneaking it in and, and make believe or something, trying to get the story out that way. But yeah, I, I, I do think that um, that fiction is is a way of, um, of, of, of telling the truth. Yeah. Adania, for you is this true as well? Because you, of course, have written non-fiction, narrative essays and so on, as well as fiction. But then I'm quite interested in what turns you to write fiction instead. Is that about expressing some truth that you can't tell through facts? It's actually about my love to language. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I write fiction in Arabic. I'm, a, I'm just in love with this language. So, And it allows... It, it allows I, I was speaking before about the stutterers. Uh, I think mm -hmm. fiction, especially you know, Arabic. Arabic is actually... Uh, it's a... It's a it's an e easy. It's an easy invitation to write because uh, you have the classical Arabic that you um, you hear in the news and in the cartoon. And if you start speaking classical Arabic, you will sound really ridiculous. So, but we learn it the whole time. We're in love with it. You know, you're being in kind of uh, um, charmed by it since childhood, and then you can only live with it in writing. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, I think actually, yeah, it's it's not more about truth; it's more about life. It is the life. It is the life and love. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Pretty valid reason as well. Damn. And, and uh, I don't like English, so I write non-fiction English. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's very interesting. There's a divide. <laughs> um, Damon, for you, is there that kind of a truth that comes out in fiction? And of course, you do write plays as well as as well as books. Oh. Hello? Yeah. yeah. I'm always a bit embarrassed when people call me a playwright because the last play I wrote was about 30 years ago. But I, <laughs> I, you know, I guess once you've done something, it hangs around your neck. I, um, I sort of feel... Um, I, I wrote a book earlier, an earlier novel called Arctic Summer, which is about E.M. Forster. 
um, a person and a milieu that really doesn't overlap with mine at all. And that involved uh, a large amount of historical research. The promise is drawing on my own memories of being, you know, the last 30, 40 years or years I've lived through. No research required, and yet those years are now really, um, it's almost sort of historical fiction at this point. So, I don't know, I think there's a distinction between um, recording history and evoking history, if I can put it that way. So, I guess with the Foster book, I was trying to record it, and I was quite struck by the um, responses around memory here. I don't know how many people have ever sat with their siblings and talked about their childhood, and how, I mean, I had the experience, and it was astonishing to me how different our accounts of our childhood were. I mean, we lived through the same events, but our memories and impressions were almost a different story. Um, for some people, an event that was happy can be a little traumatic. I mean, you know, children are very idiosyncratic in their reactions, but you see the same thing in a courtroom. Nobody remembers the same event the same way. So somebody said, I can't remember who, uh, about history, it's events, dear boy, events. Um, and I guess that's what it is. You, you, there are events, and those are facts, but how those events are perceived, how they live through, there's a tissue of sensibility that is unique to the people who went through that. So I guess with the promise, what I was trying to do was evoke history, a flavor of it, how it felt to me, essentially, to be living at that time. Um, and that's maybe a truth, um, you know, that's, that's mine alone. Other people might have felt or perceived those events very differently, but we don't dispute the fact that those events occurred. Although people do, it has to be said. I mean, there are a lot of, and it's generally, um, again, the point that um, was raised by Adania about the oppressor wants to control the narrative, right? So if there's been an atrocity or abuse, there is always denial that that thing took place. Um, but there is another narrative that can push back against that. And we see that, we saw that in South Africa for a long time, people's stories were absolutely suppressed. Those people did not exist, their history did not matter. And in the aftermath of the democratic election, there was a sudden surge of memoir and autobiography of people needing to tell their stories, however subjective those stories might have been. Capita, I'm not going to expect you to defend the entire genre of non-fiction, to sit here and say conviction do something non-fiction cannot. But I think something that is very interesting is what we've sort of this idea we've been approaching of actually the fact that your interviewees are storytelling. They are they are building a narrative, and that's not to cast doubt on it, but that they are telling you their version of the truth. <laughs> they are. I mean. Well, I actually wanted to pick up on, on what a couple of people were saying, which is I think um, particularly for partition memories, because all of us have come to them so late, um, here, um, Bangladesh, India, Britain, um, I mean Urvashi Battaglia began collecting memories in the 90s and what's really interesting is when I spoke to historians and said well what were you doing guys in the 50, you know, 50th, 60th anniversary, why were you not collecting survivor testimonies and they said because people wouldn't speak they weren't ready um, and what I would say is in the absence of actual testimonies those stories that you're talking about, those truths we had to rely on fiction we had to rely on um, films and actually that, that those works became the truth. Um, Manto, for example, was telling us stories that we weren't hearing from the people who lived through it because it was too unbearable, it was too traumatic, but it existed. But it couldn't exist in their own words, it was too much. And so, and so we needed the fiction and we needed the film because for many decades, that's all we had to recount that time. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's very striking that all of you are writing about very, really traumatic histories, and we've obviously been coming around to that particular question. You know, none of you is writing a 
frivolous book about you know big party at the court of the sun king although i said this earlier and damon said that's his next one so you know <laughs> we'll wait that one um but there is something you know under all of this that is obviously deeply meaningful and traumatic a term we hear but i think it's been mentioned already today on the panel is about generational trauma uh, where the effects of trauma might be passed down in families now i think we all understand how that could happen behaviorally but there is some research that suggests that there actually might be a sort of epigenetic effect to trauma um, that dna doesn't change but that there might be phenotypic changes to the sequence to how it's carried down there's a sort of chemical marker on the descendants bodies I'd like to ask all of you really about whether exploring history, whether through fact or fiction, in any way you're approaching it, might be a way of beginning to process this trauma, which is why maybe that's the reason we're drawn to it. Adania, could you reflect on that for us? You know, I'm careful with the term trauma, and I don't know why. I mean, I've, I've never felt a relation to this term. Uh, it's like almost worse than history, so I feel like I'm, I'm constantly stumbling against these terms and I, I don't know how to deal with them. Uh, maybe, maybe my problem with the trauma, it's the definition of that. Is it like there is something contained and you can hold and, 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 and deal with? And sometimes it's, or maybe, yeah, it, it's something, it's very harsh. You. Um, yeah. Actually, you don't want to hold. It's almost like this burning stone, like you just want to throw away. And uh, uh, maybe there are other forms. Um, and I think uh, fiction is, is fascinating because going back to, to history, like how can you trust um, a method that constantly uh, establishes itself on the exclusion? Of, of others and, and they uh, and you know we're talking about the, the colonized and, and the, the, the colonialists and what type of history is being written and actually the, the, the rise of this uh, um, discipline uh, and, and a certain way of, of narration it's almost this kind of linearity uh, that you you don't relate to that movement in time uh, there are different movements of time so uh, I think also trauma somehow fits within this uh, uh, moment of history. There's a trauma, there's a past, you're dealing with it. But I mean, I wonder also what defines it. Sometimes I, I, we have this joke, like, what is this worse? To be, um, you know, to be kind of uh, uh, suffering the pain of colonization or the pain of love, you know, but there's no measurement of pain. Pain is pain, and so it's, it's, it kind of enters your, your being, the way you see things. Maybe we are formed by, by, by these incidents, we, so we cannot take a position outside of it to, to reflect on that. I don't know if this makes sense. I think it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Louise, is this similar for you? Does trauma sort of form the world, and that's where you write from? Or is this kind of fictional way of beginning to make sense of that, process it in some way? Mm. Yeah, I never um, considered myself to be, you know, a, tra a traumatised uh, person. Um, but people have said to me, oh, you know, that things that happened to you, oh, those were traumas. But I don't even know. It's maybe, I, I just presume that there ought to be some sort of trauma response. That, that That's what it meant. But I didn't feel that. But I think that, um, I think I didn't understand, maybe until a bit later, uh, the reason that I thought I had randomly chosen uh, the year 1975, to, you know, uh, in which to set the novel, um, but that was a year of, uh, the, you know, of, uh, the, of, a, of great change in my family. Um, so after a couple of bomb explosions, and uh, my grandmother had been injured in a, a, a separate bomb, um, uh, they sold the family business and, and moved to the south. So I had lived for several years with all of my uh, father's family within walking distance of our house, and then within a few months they were gone. Um, so I think that maybe, and then we were gone a few years later, so I think that maybe that's why that was the year. Um, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't feel like it's like really kind of rehabilitated me or anything, but um, I, I think that my, from my parents' point of view, um, the class system in the north of Ireland is a little bit complicated because, um, because of the religious division. And um, we were part of, um, of a, a small, tight, 
kind of little class system that was probably as nasty as all class systems are. And um, we were lucky enough to be sort of, um, I suppose, middle class or, or, or whatever within that system. Um, um, and, um, you, you know, the people at the bottom of the system would have called us, it's a pretty horrible term, uh, castle Catholics. And it's a little bit of a shameful um, history to have. I suppose the question is, how do you get on in a place where you're being deliberately excluded? So what actually have you done to do well? And um, so there's a bit of shame attached to that. So I think that, um, yeah, maybe my parents felt um, that, you know, they, <coughs> the, the lives that they led have been explained to some extent because it's not something that anybody really wants to, to read about. Damon, you're specifically writing about yeah. generations. <laughs> Um, so if we think about this idea of generational trauma, it kind of, uh, I suppose there's a way in which that's evolving through the family in your book, at some level, as, almost as we've watched. Um, how do you think this affects South Africa now in your writing? Yeah, it's a little bit mysterious, but I do believe there's such a thing as generational trauma. How it's transmitted, whether it's, you know, genetic or through language or, you know, passed on values, it's, that's, that's where the mystery is for me. Um, you know, your first sense of the world comes to you through your family, and your family, there are internal signals in the family about what's acceptable, not acceptable, what's right, what's wrong. And I remember, you know, the signals I was receiving growing up is that, well, the situation we're in might seem bizarre, unnatural, but it is in fact the necessary order. And, uh, you know, this is normal. In other words, the rest of the world may not understand us. And then, of course, that narrative has been reversed and we're having to relearn things. I'm always struck by, um, to think of the Vietnam War, how many stories, films, accounts America has sort of put out there about this big national trauma. South Africa had a war of its own on its northern border with Angola. And... You know, people I was at school with and generations before and after passed through that war. It was every bit as traumatic as Vietnam. And the, yet, it's astonishing to me how few of those stories have ever been told. Um, there's a kind of a silence around it. And I believe there's a corresponding repression, national repression, if you like, which comes out in the form of, a, of sick behavior. I mean, South Africa's enormously high levels of violence, for me, are unprocessed trauma. If you think of the psychological model, if you can bring somebody to articulate what it is that hurts them, there is relief for that hurt. Um, and I think that's true for a nation too. And, and perhaps novels are one way of um, speaking the trauma of a nation, even if you yourself you know, didn't I mean, I'm, I'm not a victim of South Africa's trauma. I, did, I was not at the, uh, the bottom end of the pile. And yet we're all part of it somehow. And whoever can speak sort of feels the need to, I think. I've been asked to talk, start taking questions. I think we have till 2 p.m., is that right? Yeah, good. Okay, in that case, because I really would like to just give cover to at least a quick comment on this question of generational trauma, but I will then come for questions, so please do get your questions ready. Um, but, I mean, my goodness, of course there's generational trauma when it comes to partition. Um, but there's something else too, and this is what I hadn't realized when I embarked upon my research. So I think trauma can be passed down. Um, I know the research that you're talking about was with regard to Holocaust survivors and their descendants. And I think it can be passed down knowingly and unknowingly, but I think something else can be passed down, particularly with partition survivors, which is a sense of, um, of, of feeling for a place, a sense of loss. And that, those two things are slightly contradictory. They, you can be traumatized by what happened and maybe had to leave one country for another and cross a border, but you can also have a, a huge longing for the place that you left, and that can also be passed down to descendants. Um, and it's quite interesting for me to be going around Lahore and looking for evidence of what that world was like before 
1947. Um, you know, what, what the, the evidence of those people that, that left, and, and yet, um, I think it, it must be there, obviously, in, in the memories of people. And I had a really interesting situation where I was looking for a particular home, and I, and I knew it lived across the road from a temple. The temple doesn't live there, oh, it doesn't exist anymore. But everybody knew where that temple was, even the little boy that guided us. And so there is carried on these memories um, of the, the people who lived side by side with maybe their grandparents or their or their or their parents. Um, and so I, I think that these things live on, but they're sometimes quite intangible. Thank you. I would just stick your hand up if you have a question and I think we'll get a microphone to you. There's a gentleman just up here please. Hello everyone. I am Sarwar Khan, and uh, it seems to me that history is like. Could you, sorry, could you speak right into the microphone, just so we can? It's, it seems to me that history is like a garbage. It all, it is always there, and it never disappears, and it is constantly recycled. But my question is: some histories are suppressed or swallowed by other histories. So how far do you think fiction can popularize suppressed histories, while at the same time? entertain people from diverse backgrounds because fiction involves histories uh, narratives and the authenticities of those narratives are more scrutinized than those of histories because uh, uh, they are considered as fiction not based on a factual history um Adania, would you like to take that because it seems to touch on points you made about suppressed narratives I think I somehow responded to that. I, I, I mean, yeah. So, any other thoughts from the panel? Okay, we'll take another question. Uh, there's a lady at the front just here. Yeah, hello. I'm a documentary filmmaker and I've made many films on partition. And uh, uh, I'm fascinated by this panel and the variety that they have brought up, particularly the relationship between fiction and non-fiction. So I'm bothered about a fashionable term which we use in the classroom and read about, and it's inverted commas, an artistic license. So to what degree, is my question to the whole panel, is artistic license allowed? And I, I, for myself, I am very, uh, it's very clear that I will not go along with even one centimeter of something which has been researched and has just been distorted. For what reason? Number one seems to be commercialism or pressure of uh, television stations to, you know, create stories, editors, and things like that. But what is the opinion of the... I have a really, it's really, um, it's interesting because my, my book was turned into a play and I was constantly the most boring person in the room because I would say, well, you can't say that because that wouldn't have happened, even though it would have been a great plot line, perhaps. Or, and so I was always pulling back into fact and into history. So there were two things at play. There was the history of partition, which is hugely complex and contested still today, as you know. Um, but there were also the stories they were being based on my oral histories and I didn't want those tampered with because I, I have those stories in, in great detail in their transcripts and so I, I thought you had to also remain true to those stories so my view is it, it was not fiction so it should utterly be respected the history um, of the time, but also of those people. But I think it's probably, I don't know, maybe it's different if you're writing fiction, how true you remain to what actually happened and, and, how, and where you depart. 
I was very conscious that um, I was inventing um, a story set in a time uh, that was very, you know, that was um, very violent, very painful for people. And also, um, since then, you know, we didn't have any, you know, truth and reconciliation opportunities. So a lot of people are still carrying a lot of, um, of pain. And I didn't want... Um, I, I wanted everything else about the book to be as true as possible. So, um, you know, uh, there's a structuring motif of the news, the daily news um, throughout the book. And that very much corresponds with, um, uh, matches the news on corresponding days in, in 1975, for example. And, um, yeah, but I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess there is still a, quite a lot of license. Um, yeah. I think we've got time for one more very quick question, please. Um, there's a gentleman just up here with his hand up. Thank you for the great discussion. My question is, history has interpreted the colonialism as a whim of some of individual conquerors, colonizers and politicians, but not as an entire English society's urge to dominate other societies. Colonialism is presented as a policy of rulers, but not an expression of the wish or behavior of the entire English society. Why historians have ignored the English society of 19th and 20th century when it comes to indictment for colonial atrocities? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? <laughs> Panelists stand into silence. <laughs> this question. Maybe I just can say something actually, and uh, which is not related to history, but relating to reflecting on on these societies. And we can find it a lot in cultural studies. I mean, the work of Stuart Hall is is important. I mean, uh, you know, there is different methods are coming to to reflect on that, to open up that discipline, let's say, of history, and, uh, and maybe it's not about history in this, uh, uh, in this uh, case that is best equipped to reflect on societies at this time. And I think that the, the way how Stuart Hall constantly comes back to the materials that were produced and through that analyzing the practices of the society, it's almost like, you know, you... you what cultural studies is doing is researching everything until that moment that something was created. It's almost like the, the, the prehistory of, of the act, you know? Like, okay, this table, but we're gonna investigate the, the carpenter and how the carpenter came about to produce this table. And uh, this is an important work, and, and I think uh, cultural studies, I mean, I'm a propagator of that, it, it is uh, allowing the seepage different possibilities of thinking and also in, really, in, in uh, relating to, to time and places and absent narratives or deleted and erased narratives. I don't know if this answers you. Thank you very much. Yes, by all means, applaud. Um, thank you very much. And in fact, a round of applause for my panelists. Um, Adonia Shibley, Louise